Hi, everybody. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. This is Ashley from the Gain Center. Uh, today we are, have our guest speaker, Nancy Smith, with us. Um, she will be, will be discussing a family member's perspective on AOT. Just last week we heard from Nancy's son, Eric, when he discussed um, his personal experience with AOT. And um, we usually have Laverne Miller as our facilitator. Today we'll be um, talking with Matt Knutson. He's a colleague at Policy Research Associates. He'll be facilitating the discussion today. Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, we'll get started. I'm Matt Knutson. Okay. I'm, a policy, I'm, a, I'm a project associate at Policy Research Associates in Del Mar, New York. Um, I'm also a person in recovery. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means to me in a minute. Um, I work on a number of different projects uh, spanning from homelessness, um, ensuring that people with lived experience are able to be inserted across the service system, whether that be criminal justice, um, hospitals, out in the community. Um, peers played an important role in my recovery. And I'll just talk about myself for a tiny bit. Um, so I am a person that had um, substance abuse issues and mental health issues from a very young age. Um, you know, and young age meaning, you know, I first had mental health services at the age of five um, and was in therapy and different services from that age all the way up until early adulthood. Um, included in my story is substance abuse, which started at a relatively young age as well. Um, and like a lot of people, the substance abuse was really kind of working in an attempt to um, medicate, you know, trauma and medicate feelings that I had or, you know, um, depression or different, you know, um, mental health issues or just being able to cope. They were a coping mechanism that worked for a little bit of time, but they quickly turned on me until they didn't anymore, and they caused me a lot of, um, you know, unmanageability and issues, which included hospitalizations, jail, um, bouts of homelessness, um, and then I was able to eventually be engaged into services, um, which included benefits um, that helped me, you know, be able to stabilize and have housing um, that was available for me for a certain period of time in the beginning of my journey, um, and then I was able to go back to school because I had dropped out of high school and get my GED and then a two-year degree, and then a four-year degree, and now I have my master's in um, public policy. And I'm lucky enough to have, you know, really been able to work in positions where I was able to fight for and work to implement recovery-oriented solutions um, with the idea really in mind that I want everybody to be able to um, enjoy the benefits of recovery. And included kind of in, you know, that, has been, you know, wanting to make sure that people of all races, um, gender, sexual orientation were able to enjoy the gifts of recovery kind of equally. Um, so a lot about disparities has been a large portion of my work. Um, now more directly to families, my family was, um, you know, very instrumental in my recovery. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of, they did, Typically what you would do, you know, there's always that kind of um, balancing act between whether or not they were enabling me versus whether or not they were just keeping me alive and different things like that. Um, but they were always present in my life. Um, so that really meant following me around from hospitals to jails. And um, they spent a lot of time in visiting and waiting rooms in my life until I was able to find recovery. Um, and it also created a lot of unmanageability around the household. So you know, stealing and, um, you know, certain acts of violence and certain things like that were definitely a part of um, my story before I entered recovery. I mean, I'm lucky, very, very lucky that I had a very supportive family that was also functional, you know, instead of dysfunctional. And I think about that in terms of that's one of the things that made my life, I think, a little bit easier um, because a lot of people their families might not be as supportive of them or their families might not be, you know, I know a lot of people that have had family members take benefits from them or I've had a lot of people where their families were some of the people that they had to avoid because they were using substances and they were trying to avoid people that were using substances. I luckily was not in that position in my family. Nobody in my family actually even drinks, um, let alone uses um, illicit substances. So it was always a lot easier for me 
to then be comfortable with going back and spending time with them and getting support from them. Um, so, you know, all the way up till now, and then, then you know, they're still in my life and through college and different things, they were very supportive as well. Um, and they're just as happy as I am that recovery um, ended up working out for me. So now I am going to turn it over to our speaker, and I have a series of questions that were prepared in advance. Um, and I'll introduce Nancy Smith. Um, and you, if you were on the call last week, the last call, you were able to listen to her son speak. Um, she's going to discuss her experiences and perspective as a mother. Um, and Eric, her son, is now um, a young adult. She'll discuss her largely unsuccessful efforts to get him engaged in treatment and how his lack of involvement in treatment impacted the lives of family members and how AOT was able to successfully engage her son into treatment and other services. Um, and she's going to talk about how family members can be supportive of recovering loved ones. Um, so now I have a series of questions. I might choose as we go along, Nancy, if that's fine, to ask some additional questions as we move along and depending on how time permits. Um, but first question is, tell us about yourself. Okay. First, I would like to thank you, Matt, for sharing. I'm almost in tears. It's like listening to our family story uh, the last 20 or 30 years. And, um, and I'm so glad that yours is a success story. And um, I, I lost my computer. I'm so sorry. Um, hold on one second. I don't know why. Can you still hear me? Nancy, we can still hear you, and I can still, we can yeah. still oh. see you as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. How interesting. That was so strange. I don't know why it went away. Um, also, I would like to thank everyone who works uh, to implement and expand AOT in their counties and states because, as Matt was explaining and as I will tell you, it has been the, the critical link in saving Eric. And um, uh, I don't think we'd be having the same conversation today if AOT did not exist in our county. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and um, I am retired now, I will tell you. Um, uh, I, I think I've lived longer than the 100 years I've already lived, it seems. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, I've always been lucky enough to work out of my home. I, I was in sales. And so I was there when our two boys were growing up. And then um, in actually just as Eric was getting diagnosed, my parents moved from California to stay with us because um, my father felt that he didn't have very many years left and he wanted to be sure my mother had care uh, that was, you know, with someone who loved her and would care for her. But as it turned out, we lost my mom first. and. Um, uh, than my dad a few years later, but and always involved in rescue, dog rescue. So we probably had five dogs running around at the time. Well, Eric was at home. So it was a busy household and very demanding, and I was working very long hours. Um, you would think working at home, I would get up from my desk and leave, but at, at the dinner hour, but it wasn't so easy because I thought, well, I'll just go back and do a few things, and six hours later, I was still working. So um, it was a very complicated time, but at least I was home. So if the kids needed anything or my parents, um, either my husband and I were available. So uh, uh, that's, um, that's how it was at that time. And and over the years, I think I do want to say that um, I think my faith has deepened because uh, I found a saying once: I don't, I don't believe in miracles; I rely on them. And that seems to be the case. Eric's uh, recovery, uh, his journey, has been a miracle. Um, we have two grandchildren, and our little grandson last year at age four months had to have open heart surgery and um, he's almost two now but um, that was a miracle so I really think every day every good day is a miracle and and I and with counseling 
I went to counseling, of course, because I had to learn new coping skills. We had to keep the anxiety level to a minimum in the house, and that is a difficult task, but, and I still work on it every day. Even though Eric is stable, it doesn't mean that three adults living in, in the same, I mean, Eric has his own side of the house that was actually added on. We were lucky enough to, to find this house that had almost like a separate little uh, wing for him. I, I say wing, it's, it's uh, you know, a, a, just a section of the house that we're able to separate and still have some privacy. And um, it's, um, well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a better story today. And Eric finished his undergraduate work yesterday and will start um, graduate school in the summer. So again, another miracle that we just never thought could happen. And we are so very grateful. Very good. So can you talk about when you first became concerned about Eric? Well, I, I, I really knew that Eric was he was a very precocious child, and but nevertheless probably had bipolar from a very early age. But again, we just thought because he was just so smart and and witty, and and he was just an amazing child. That um, but still, uh, you know, it was it took took a lot of parenting, but we did uh, seek a counselor. Uh, when he was younger and uh, got a few guidelines. And however, when uh, I think puberty set in probably uh, was when things really changed. His academic uh, work just plummeted and um, just attitude. And I thought, well, we're going to take him to the doctor. And I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I had just read an, uh, an article about the signs if your child is on drugs. And so I took him to our pediatrician, but of course I told him I was taking him, and if he was or wasn't, but he didn't test positive for drugs at that time. And so um, uh, the pediatrician suggested um, a counselor, a psychiatrist or psychologist, and we did, and he put him on ADD drugs. Those didn't work. They made him very uncomfortable. And so we just did some counseling. And then um, they suggested some testing. And the testing was shocking. And we didn't believe it. We were kind of in denial, I, su I, I suppose. We had him tested again. And then another counselor was suggested. And I think probably during Eric's teens, uh, by this time, he was 15, and truly his diagnosis was there. Um, it, uh, we probably had seen probably anywhere from 15 to 20 psychiatrists, psychologists in, in our city. It was um, many people actually didn't want to work with Eric. He had a lot of attitude, and they didn't like the way he talked to us during counseling. It was a, it was a very unusual um, it was very unusual progress until we actually got to someone that worked with Eric. And um, I'm not saying it was perfect, but it was better for a while. And then it happened that Eric didn't really well. He was unimpressed with his diagnosis and. He really he didn't take his meds as he should, as I would find out later. And at the time, I hate to say, say this because I'm an intelligent person, but we didn't think and no one did tell us that we had to watch him take his meds. And we assumed he was taking his meds because we asked him. But after a, a period of time, we realized I could tell when he hadn't taken his meds in a day or two. And it was a challenge. And then it got to be very difficult having him live at home. So, and he was working at the time, and we told him we would help him, but he'd have to move out because it was really affecting our family. It was affecting our marriage. It was, it was just, it was so hostile all the time. And 
and he did move nearby. He was 20 by this time, and he did he moved nearby. But then we would find that um, he would slip from not taking his meds, and he wasn't uh, he wasn't a good neighbor in his apartment complex. So and then we would move him, and um, finally. Uh, I'm skipping over years, but um, we didn't know what to do any longer. And a conversation with a uh, really good psychiatrist said that really the only way that Eric, you need to get Eric hospitalized, and of course he didn't want to do that, but um, the only way is hopefully if you could find a way to have him arrested. And Eric was the answer because he found it himself after a series of, of several kind of um, difficult episodes and challenging where uh, we were getting a little concerned for um, our security in the house. Um, Eric, my husband asked Eric to um, step outside that he couldn't talk to us that way or be threatening in any way. And he went and sat on the porch, and we said if he didn't leave, we were going to call the police. And Eric said, go ahead, which really was, I think, the time maybe Eric was ready to have some help because I don't think he had any other way to, any other roads to turn, any, any, any place for help because um, he had been living in his car, and there have been so many episodes of, um, challenging episodes and discomfort that um, I think I think he was ready to kind of give up and and then that started the whole new challenge with the courts and trying to get him a bed at the state hospital sorry if I rambled on it just it evolved no and that helps us kind of get a picture of you know what the issues were so we could have a good understanding of kind of, you know, the level of, you know, I guess chaos in the home or the level of what was happening. Um, so who, how did you end up making the decision to go from not having an AOT order to using an AOT order? And can you talk a little bit about failed attempts like prior? Because obviously going to, Getting an AOT order is different than just, you know, hoping or trying to engage somebody in treatment. But when, and for most people, it's kind of like, you know, more of a, you know, last resort, if you will. But what made you kind of go from A to B and kind of pull the trigger on making a decision that that would be a good avenue for you? Well, when Eric was, um, he was in, in jail for 30 days, and that was, uh, they really wanted to, they didn't even want to put him in jail, but um, uh, I called and I called the courts to find out w what his status was, and they said they were probably going to release him because he had no prior record, and I begged them and told them that it was a, a circumstance of mental illness, and uh, the secretary said she would flag his, his, um, his, uh, file and but she said I don't know how long they can keep them and it was uh, truly a matter of of being on the phone several times a day almost every day to keep them incarcerated because they wanted to release him and uh, and how they release them here in Bear County is uh, it would be at midnight the day that his uh, his time was up at midnight, they would turn him loose on the streets downtown. Well, to someone in Eric's position, how would that be helpful? I mean, it wouldn't be helpful at all. And I said, no. I said he needs to be in the in the he needs to be hospitalized. And I worked with a lot of people. We went down and talked to the district attorney, and uh, and they kept him in jail. And then I started calling the state hospital because there was a whole list of people that needed to get into the, you know, that were next to be a patient, to be transferred. And I finally got through to the head of the hospital and was telling him a bit of Eric's history and, and, and begged. I, just, I did beg. 
and um, they got a bed for him. And I then went back to the jail, and you know pro they promised they would they would red flag his his file so that he wouldn't be released that night. After 30 days, they had to release him, but it it was it was really walking on a fine line to make sure that he wasn't released and that he went to the state hospital. And then when he got there, we met him there, and he didn't want, he hadn't had meds now for 30 days, and he was totally decompensated. And uh, it, was, it was frightening to see him in that position, but we finally did talk him into allowing, he didn't even want anybody to take his blood, but we finally um, talked him into doing that, and, um, and they also were able to give him some medication and uh, and then uh, we thought everything was okay and and he would be there for treatment. And in one week, we got a call that they wanted to uh, they were going to release him. And I said, "How can you release him? He is still uh, he's delusional." And they said, "Not being you know being clear of thought or or rather being delusional is no criteria for for not releasing them. That is not how it works." And, you know, hence the revolving door, if every, anyone heard Eric speak of it and they did make a documentary about it, it is a revolving door. Once you're in the state hospital, if there is no AOT, um, they're out. They're out for a week or two maybe or a month until something dreadful happens and they're taken back. Um, but we went in and had a conversation with the doctor and he said he'd keep them another week. And then the social worker called us, and they said, nope, we've got to let Eric go. And I said, well, I said, we're kind of concerned because Eric is, at this time, we feel a danger to himself and others, and I don't feel comfortable bringing him home, so what do you do? And they said, well, they find a bed down at the mission, and, of course, he has to be out under bridge during the day with all the, with all the drug addicts. And I said, that's just not going to work. Um, and then finally, a social worker, and I talked to a lot of people, told me about the um, we, uh, ILPC is what we call it here, uh, involuntary outpatient commitment. But uh, it's, it's virtually AOT, and, um, and that's how Eric got connected to AOT because because honestly, and I don't want to pat myself on the back because it just makes me cry and I, I can't believe we went through it, but we persevered. We just persevered until someone said they would take him into this program. And that's how Eric got connected with AOT and truly saved his life because it's what kept him, they were willing to keep him longer in the state hospital and it is what got him um, readmitted the next couple of times he had to be readmitted very quickly because he was in the program. Are you still there? Yes, yes, sorry. I'm just taking okay. a breath. But that's how we got to oh, yeah, yeah. AOT is because um, I refused to let him be discharged from the hospital to the street. Okay, so that answers a lot of the questions. Um, so did you have a clear understanding about what AOT was and how it worked, and who in that process explained it to you? Uh, well, one of the social workers did uh, explain it to us, and one of uh, the patient liaisons uh, also helped explain it. And, um, and they explained that Eric actually had to, he had to sign himself in, but into the program, but if not, the judge would have, I'm sure, but it was nice that Eric was able to, uh, you know, waive his rights to AOT, well, ILPC in our, our case, but, um, uh, and they explained what, what would happen, and there would be a social worker, and, um, and we would, and they gave us numbers to call and so forth. And I also had a good relationship with the, with one of the nurses at the hospital and the doctor. I mean, I, I suppose we probably forced ourselves on them, but um, 
we just we just stayed involved and and AOT is a miracle and without it it probably wouldn't have mattered about our involvement but um, so I'm also for you know that I think everyone needs a, you know a, a family advocate uh, it's so critical and I, I think AOT works best with a family advocate. So really, in some ways, well, I'll, I'll ask it like a question, though, and I'm trying to not um, lead too much. I want to hear more of the story. Um, but in what way was AOT beneficial for Eric as opposed to the services just being maybe already available to him? you know what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I, I'm not sure that the services were uh, available. I, I mean, services, honestly, even financial services like Medicaid was not available to Eric because he had worked. And so he was between a rock and a hard place. And um, uh, I, I don't think there were that many community services that, that would have kept us in a connection. Eric was, he was assigned a doctor uh, through the uh, mental, the uh, University of Texas Health Science System. Um, there was a nurse advocate. Um, there were people that, that we as family members could call if, uh, even when Eric was in a group home, kind of a halfway house for a short period of time that the county did arrange for and did cover. Um, when his medicine wasn't available, I mean, they were able to, to contact us. We contacted some of, uh, you know, uh, a social worker, and we, we, we just made ourselves part of the AOT team, and it is a team. And so it was Eric's second family, if it, as it were, and I don't think the same services or the same involvement would have been there if it, if it weren't such a, a, a critical team that was run by a judge. Because when people didn't mm -hmm. do what they were supposed to, there were consequences. Yeah, got it. And because, you know, there's always more weight in a situation when a judge is involved and a judge is kind of, you know, raising the level of accountability for the providers and for everybody else to be doing um, what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So I get it. So you did answer the question. Um, I was just curious about that piece, you know, because the comparison would be, you know, really, again, what would happen if the service were services in, in another dimension somewhere, if the services were just made available and people were already going to do what they should be doing for their jobs um, with some coordination, if you know, people would then be able to get the services without needing to have a court order that, um, you know, then kind of forces the process along, but you answered that. So the other thing that I was curious about, which is a little bit of an added question, um, is so was it, cl was it clear to Eric that he needed to do A, B, C, and D, or – E was going to happen, and what was E, and how was that communicated to him, and like, were there sanctions? You know, I'm trying to differentiate this in my mind from a uh, treatment court of some kind. Well, once, once Eric was in AOT, I mean, our first, uh, our first visit to the uh, little courthouse at, at where his doctor was, um, we were we were introduced to the entire team, and um, the judge uh, told Eric, and and he said, look, he said, I signed you into this program, and he, you know, and and he said, now you're here. He said, but I can quickly change your status the minute you don't do what you're supposed to do. And he said, I want you to know that. He said, it just takes a signature. And um, he said, I have a whole team to help me. You know, the social workers, the sheriff was there, a bailiff. I mean, there were, and it was, um, and, and Eric believed them. 
that was the first time I, I, I knew he believed them. And also, I don't think Eric ever wanted to go back to the hospital. I mean, he, he was glad to be out of the hospital once we were there in AOT, you know, outside of the hospital. But, um, of course, it was no fault of Eric's. And, and we truly, when he, it wasn't long that he was in a halfway house and we did wind up bringing him back home. But we were in charge of his medicine. It was locked. And we made sure we watched him take it. And, you know, there was none of the old days. There was no trust, let me say that. There was no trust. There was hope and prayer, but there was no trust. And um, it was, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, I don't know. I, I'm so sorry. So, I, I got caught up so in the moment of going back. So, so Eric was obviously then responsible for certain things, such as maybe controlling his behavior a little bit or taking his medicine, which you guys obviously helped with, going to outpatient treatment and doing some of the treatment activities. And then it was kind of like in his mind, if he didn't do that, then he was going to go back to the hospital. Yes, and I do. I'm so sorry. I do recall what I was trying to get to on his meds, the fact that he did wind up in the hospital again it was no fault of his own. It was he, yeah. he must have been on 10 to 20 meds before we finally got to the clozapine and, uh, you know, the gold standard and that he was able to stabilize. So it was no fault of his own. It's just the meds would stop to work, stop working and he would decompensate again. And, and it was difficult. So because we did know, we were told that for every time that someone decompensates, it's sometimes harder to come back. And uh, it was frightening. It was frightening for us. Mm -hmm. So can you talk, you talked about the need for more family support so that you could be supported through the process a little bit more. And I think it would be a great idea if all AOT programs, you know, had robust processes that, kind of worked on family advocacy and family empowerment as well as consumer empowerment as a, as a part of the process. Um, but talk about now that you're to the other side, you know, what is your relationship with Eric like now and, like, what is his life like to just kind of give us a good contrast of this program was able to change his life. But I'm, you talked a little bit about him starting grad school, which is amazing and awesome. You know, education was a big part of my recovery, actually, like a very intricate part. You know, it was, you know, um, it was something that gave me something to do. It gave me hope. Um, you know, there's also proof scientifically that learning new ideas is healthy for your brain and releases good chemicals into your brain. So I think that that was part of the reason I so immersed myself in school when I was early in recovery. Um, but what is your life like now as a, as compared with before? Well, it was a, it was a challenge, uh, honestly, from the moment he could speak and he could speak early. Eric was challenging, and both my boys are very gifted. They're very, very intelligent. Um, but Eric was challenging, and I know as, as Eric got older, it was difficult sometimes my older son didn't want to come home from college because there was so many there was just fighting and yelling and screaming and and it was chaotic and um and i honestly i didn't um if you had asked me then i don't know uh i prayed every day that eric as as he got uh as he decompensated further that eric would survive and we couldn't hold on to him and he was living in his car and and just not taking care of himself. And, you know, every time that we think there was some hope, um, and it, it was, and at one point they had him so medicated uh, in one psychiatrist that he, he couldn't even speak. And we thought, is this how he has to live in order to not wind up uh, hurting himself? I don't know. I, I mean... He, he never tried, but the, the thought and the worry was there. And um, it was just it was just fear and unrest and chaos. And, um, but there was still a lot of love in our house. And, 
and um, and Eric, uh, you know, we were still we stayed in touch with Eric, even though Eric was disagreeable and and I mean he couldn't help it. I, I mean in his state of mind, but but um, it was it was so hard to have. There was no normalcy. That was normal at the time, and now it's uh, it has been uh, really. Um, I, I think it, it, I never expected to have a life. When there was a poem that I had that I, when, when the boys were little, a friend gave it to me, and it was about, you know, never mind the housework, you know, read to your children, color with your children, uh, you know, the housework will stay, but your children grow up so fast. And now I often think that this is the first time well, in the last few years, that I, I have, I, I have. It's like I have a do-over with my son. That, um, I mean, of course, different than when he was, you know, a toddler. Or, um, but I actually am able to spend quality time and know that he's. Um, He's, he's got a, he's got a chance and he will make a difference in this world and he is he is he is so amazing and and so gifted and his college experience has been a wonderful journey for him because his professors have loved him truly he because he studies I mean he's had like 32 straight A's and in this last little while and and um, uh, and they respect and admire him because he has respect for the professors and and he's, his worth, his self worth, uh, I I think has finally is finally where it should be. So that um, not narcissism, just um, that he is an important part of of our family and. He will be, I think, to, I know he will be, to society. He's already made a difference. I mean, in just the different times he's spoken. And he has helped um, kids in school that, you know, are having problems. And he's even run into someone that I think used to work at the state hospital and someone that was actually a patient there. And I said, gosh, Eric, you, you know, look, you're miles ahead of me. But, you know, Eric's trying to give them hope as well. So... Um, it's it, it is it's just a do-over and another miracle that um, I uh, I have a I have a chance to to know. I mean, I, I even wonder sometimes did we teach him how to live? Did he he was never in a place where we could teach him uh, how to live, how to shop, how to how to manage his life? And of course, now quickly, the, the, you know, he he's matured, but. But he was never in a position to even learn about day-to-day -day living, and so, um, as I say, it is a miracle and it's a gift to our family. Sorry. Great, thank you. So, Ashley, would we do we open it up now for questions from the participants on the call? Sure. Yeah. I. So um, I'm looking at the chat box. So I, I actually um, asked anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to type them, read them in the chat box, and I can read them um, out loud for you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure. And if, if anyone's just on the call and not on Adobe, feel free to, to ask your question to us now. That'd be fine. Okay, we have a question from Jamie. How have treatment providers included you as family in the care for your son? Uh, they've um, all uh, had Eric sign, uh, you know, HIPAA release 
so they could talk with us, and that was discussed at our first meeting. Eric didn't drive for a while, so when we did take him to doctors, um, you know, that was discussed immediately. And uh, Eric has been, you know, uh, very open to that. So we've been able to be a part of the, the team. And, 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 and while medicine med still were not, psych med still were not working, um, we were able to step in quickly. So we, as I say, we've just, we've kind of been helicopter parents, but um, I can't imagine not. Um, AOT gave us the chance to be involved with a team that, um, you know, ha had control and um, that Eric respected. And um, the team was, I, I think they were glad to have us involved most of the time. Sometimes we had a lot to say, but um, we kept ourselves involved. It was never an option for us not to be. Okay, great. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Nancy? I would just like to say that I, I first I apologize if I rambled on too long at, with some of my answers, but um, it and, and certainly skipping over uh, quickly. Some, I mean, obviously not going into detail about all the years that led up to Eric's um, final hospitalization, and I, I pray that it is um, uh, always. And I know that the doctor told Eric that if he's gone this many years without, uh, you know, um, decompensating again, that it, it seems unlikely that, that it would occur. But I don't take any days for granted. I'm grateful for every day. And um, uh, it's, it, we just wouldn't have made it without AOT. That's all I'm saying. It was, it was, um, it's what happened. Uh, it was a miracle. It was a miracle that we persevered and 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 people listened, and they were willing to make it happen so that Eric didn't was not released from jail or from the hospital, and and then the journey kind of took over itself until finally a doctor um, a doctor really. Uh, was she had the the, um, the the notice that it was time for Eric to leave the state hospital no matter what, and she just couldn't bear it. And she because she would see Eric be be clear and stable, and then all of a sudden it would only last for a week or so, and he would be you know he would be delusional again. And so she did not want to let him go because she knew his potential. And she, the state wanted her to release Eric. And it was the end of the year. He was out of funds. And they were out of funds for Eric. And she kept him. She kept him anyway. And she put him on clozapine. And within a week and a half, he was stable. And another week just to make sure and then she released him, and that was uh, that was almost that was five or six years ago. And and um, so so many people. We can go back and think about all the people that were there, were that were team members, and that were worked and 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 worked with us. And um, and every one of them was so important to the team. Every person and. We made sure to stay in touch with every person, and again, back to family advocacy to keep the team from letting go itself. If that makes sense. Yeah, Nancy, um, I do. I do have yeah. another question um, from Quentin here. What were your expectations of the judge, and was there more you think the judge could have done to support the program? 
No, the judge was the program. Uh, this was, I, I, I think he started it with another judge that was the mental health division was his. And um, he, his heart was in it. And he made sure that the program worked. And, and no, we had his home number. And so um, one of the last times that Eric was, was in our home and we thought that one of the meds he was on was working and they had released him. And, but he still had to go to the, you know, the AOT meetings and he had still had to be presented at the courthouse. But um, when it was clear that Eric had to be compensated truly, again, um, I just called the judge and the judge sent the, his mental health police team out and uh, it was very quiet and very quick and they picked him back up. But the judge, the judge was there. I mean, he was, he was a family member. He couldn't have done anything more. He, did, he, he was the reason that the team was together. It was Judge Kazin, by the way, uh, if you've seen um, um, Stopping the Revolving Door, uh, it's online with the Treatment Advocacy Center and under the web, their website. And, um, and you can see Judge Kazin and Judge Spencer, who started the program here in Bear County. Great, thank you, Nancy. Are there any other questions um, from anybody for Nancy? Quentin says, thank you, Nancy, for sharing your experience. Um, and I, I know I thank you very much. If anyone has any other questions, um, now is the time. But I did want to thank you for, for joining us today and sharing your story. Well, thank you for letting me. I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that sharing was of, of some importance. I mean, I know for those of you there that, that are AOT and make AOT happen, um, thank you. And for those of you that, have, uh, are, that are on the call that have used AOT services, I, I hope it was as successful for your family members as it has been for Eric and for our family. Uh, we, we, would not, we would not be uh, where we are today without the services. And thank you very much, Nancy. It was a great um, opportunity to get to interview you and ask you these questions. And I hope, um, you know, everybody really enjoyed and got a lot out of what we talked about. Thank you. And thank you, Matt and Ashley. But uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. It, it, uh, I, it, it, it's so gratifying to hear success stories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Everyone, have a great weekend. Have a great thank weekend, so everyone. You too. Thank you. Thank you again.